tonight a very special edition as we profile two revolutionaries, two comrades in arms and two groundbreaking 40th anniversaries. For tennis legend Billie Jean King and rock superstar Elton John, 1973 was a big year. In 73, King was the queen of tennis. She swept Wimbledon, winning singles, doubles and mixed doubles titles. Just a few of her record 20 Wimbledon titles among the 39 Grand Slams she won over her brilliant career. She was rackets blazing on and off the court. That year, she founded the Women's Tennis Association, bringing major change in a sport where women were second-class citizens at every level. Also that year, she convinced the U.S. Open to award women champions the same prize money as the men for the first time ever, and slowly every other major followed. And perhaps most famously that year, she played and beat... Bobby Riggs, a former Triple Crown winner at Wimbledon and a self-confessed male chauvinist pig. It was a massively hyped battle of the sexes, which was so much more than just a tennis match. Oh, and then Billie Jean turned 30. That same year, Elton John was in the midst of an extraordinary run on record, on radio and on the road. Forty years ago, he released his iconic double album, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, along with hit singles like Crocodile Rock and Daniel. It's also 40 years since he and Billie Jean King met, forging not just a firm friendship, but a powerful partnership in philanthropy, raising hundreds of millions of dollars so far for equal rights and for HIV AIDS prevention. Since then, their Yellow Brick Road has had more than its share of potholes, with every aspect of their personal lives hashed out in the press, but they still are at it. is on the road right now playing and promoting his critically acclaimed new album, The Diving Board. I sat down with Billie Jean and Elton John for their first ever joint in-depth interview in Orlando, Florida, site of smash hits, their celebrity-filled tennis fundraiser. 1973, an amazing year for both of you, both at the top of your games, both of you activists, and also you become friends that year. How did you meet? We met at a party that Jerry Princhio held about two weeks before I played Bobby Riggs. And, and he was the promoter? And Jerry Princhio was the promoter. When I got there, I go, oh, Jerry, you know, what's this party about? And he goes, oh, it's for Elton John. And I about fainted because Elton was my favorite, but I'd never met him. And uh, I fell in love with him with your song. And I said, you're kidding. You were his music fan. Were you a tennis fan? Of course. <laughs> I, I'm so old. Uh, I started playing by, with a wooden racket, hitting a ball up against a wall. So here we are actually sitting in a tennis stadium on a tennis yeah. court for smash hits. Right. Why is this exhibition important to you? The two great levelers I've found um, in life are music and sport that bring people together. And tennis was the one of, probably the first sport to acknowledge AIDS by far. I mean, it was way ahead of the game. You don't forget that? I don't forget that. That was very moving at a time when it wasn't fashionable to speak up for AIDS. In fact, it was totally the opposite. Let me ask you both to reflect on this year. It is also obviously 40 years for you since the famous Battle of the Sexes, King Riggs. You won record 20 Wimbledon titles, you've had 39 Grand Slam titles, and you've done unbelievable work off the court for the basic equality of the sexes. Yes. Does it bother you that a certain number of people, a certain generation might remember you just for that match with Bobby Riggs, or is that a good thing? Oh, I knew that was going to happen because of the exposure of so many millions of people watching. And at the time, in 1973, Title IX had just been passed. Uh, Equal rights for sports and federally funded. It's also in all of education. No sex discrimination for the first time. Which is a huge there deal. There was gender quotas before yeah. in, in American universities and colleges. So that broke down. Now we have more women in, in universities and colleges. But for me, tennis was my platform. And what the King Riggs match allowed was a platform for me to fight for equal rights and opportunities for boys and girls, men and women, which I had started and, and devoted my life to when I was 12. So this match, I knew, was a seminal moment. And you said beating Bobby Riggs meant nothing athletically. No, because he was the same age exactly as my dad. He was born in 1918, but that's not what mattered. It was the exposure we got. It was the emotional impact it had. People were crazy. 
They were crazy. I mean, they were making bets. They were having parties. They were, <laughs> oh, my God, you can't believe. I, every he would day, have set back the cause had you lost. Oh, I think so. Um, I didn't want Title IX to be weakened. We're only in our third year of women's mm -hmm. professional tennis. Mm -hmm. Uh, professional tennis, men's and women's, was only five years old. I mean, we were just in our infancy. So I didn't want any, I didn't want to give any excuse or any reason to go backwards. You watched the match? I watched it at a hotel in Los Angeles and mm -hmm. lost my voice. Um, I screamed so loudly. <laughs> I, you know, I think every man in, I, that I knew wanted her to win. Really? Really? Yeah, not the, absolutely. Not the chauvinist we saw really, in the audience. No, I honestly knew that all the men I knew in my life wanted her to win because Bobby was so cocky and so arrogant. I mean, when she came out, you know, and I couldn't the believe it. Like, the wow, Pharaoh's litter she's been was copying amazing. Me, right? <laughs> <It> was <fine. laughs> she's been lifted out. Yeah, no, it was fun. But it, I really think fun. at that time. Um, that if she hadn't won, it would have held back the, the, the movement of just, equality. When you have a new album out, The Diving Board. Reflect on where you are musically, personally, and what this 40th year means to you. Um, where I am musically and personally is kind of the same place. I'm very relaxed. The Diving Board for me, uh, I started it uh, two years ago in January when my son was one, Zachary. And then I finished it and I had another son um, um, the following January. Um, and I think for the first time in my 66 years on earth, um, I feel completely balanced. David and I have been together 20 years. We have a family. I would never dreamt five years ago that I would have two children. And the chance came about because we tried to adopt a little boy in the Ukraine. And because we found it so difficult and it was impossible, basically, we sat down and we reconfigured what we talked about earlier about having our own child and I said well this child in Ukraine is trying to tell me that I can be a father so I must follow this we'll have our own child after that I was dead against it well the diving board has been really well received you're still creative as you were when you were 23 yeah. you wrote Philadelphia freedom for Billy yes how did that come about she asked me to write a song for the no, Philadelphia. No, I didn't ask no? you. No, yes. we're, it, uh, did I offer you? Yes, yeah. you did. Oh, I would yeah. never have the courage to ask that. Right. First of all, I wouldn't even think about it. All right. We're going to your concert, and he says, I want to write a song for you, and I thought I was going to faint. And he goes, how about Philadelphia Freedom? And Philadelphia Freedom was a tribute to her and the tennis and the people of Philadelphia and the music that was coming out of it. It was just oh, so was coincided unreal. with the gamble and huff and the, the three degrees, Harold Melbourne and the Blue Notes, the OJs, all that great music, the spinners, all, all that wonderful music that was coming out of that sound at the moment. It became number one and then it crossed over into R&B and yeah. that's what made you happy. Well, I already had, I, yeah. He goes, it went over to cross over yeah. to R&B and became number one and he's like, yeah. yeah. He's I'm just, a white boy from England. So when <laughs> Benny and the Jets went to number one in, on the black chart, and Philadelphia followed it and then are you ready for love I had three number one um, records on the R&B chart that to me means so much you have no idea do you remember the first time you heard your song yes I was in San Francisco driving along Van Ness which is very hilly and uh, I heard of course piano is my favorite and then I heard Elton uh, sing I said who is this what what is this called so I actually I was so I was so nervous I might get in a wreck that I pulled over to the curb and I listened to the rest of the song and I said, that's it, he's my favorite, whoever this guy is. Oceans Away? Yes. From your recent album. What is that about? It's about the men and women in the First and Second World Wars who gave their life, especially the First World War, which was probably the most horrific war that ever was fought. Soon to be a hundred years. Years old, next year. That's amazing. Um, people have no idea, none of us have any idea of the horror that people went through. But those two wars were epic wars where millions and millions and millions of young people, elderly people, millions of men, millions of women, millions of animals died to save our rights. And we should never forget that. Does it sometimes pain you to see how the veterans of the Afghanistan war, the Iraq war, are treated as they come home? Yeah, absolutely disgraceful. The people who come back that have lost limbs and have trauma, um, for the rest of their lives to deal with. And they are treated so badly. You know, my dad was a firefighter, so I totally, I live with someone who risks his life every day. Zachary wants to be a firefighter. Uh, they, usually most kids do when they're young, yeah. but it's a very high risk endeavor. And uh, yeah. my dad loved his job, but you know, he came home. It, when I was 10, he almost got killed in a, in a fire and he didn't, but somebody standing five feet away from him did. And that day, I'll never forget as a 10 year old thinking, I could have lost my dad today. We, fo uh, we focus so much on celebrity in our culture, and we don't focus on the right things. And I'm so sick of seeing celebrities on
covers of magazines and you know and, po and tweeting and posts and, and, and Facebook and reality you know, it's disgusting okay but you're celebrity I hate them I know but I hate the celebrity that is around now the vacuous talentless horror show that they get paid millions of dollars for when there are people who are teaching kids every day that are trying to scrape by and get a living it's a show it's a joke mm -hmm. one of the most remarkable things I've heard you say is that from the age of 12 you realized that there was something wrong there was injustice in the world yes you were at an all-white tennis club everybody was wearing white you said and you said tennis is going to be my platform I've got to get to number one I always thought it was opposite that you wanted to be number one and then you decided to be activist at 11 I wanted to be number one and then at 12 I realized um, my calling my my sense of destiny and uh, and the question I asked at 12 about tennis is where is everybody else because Everybody was wearing white shoes, white socks, white clothes, you know, <laughs> white tennis balls in those days, now it's yellow. But the question I, I remember so clearly, I asked myself, where is everybody else? And that's really what we're talking about today. And I knew as a woman, I would have more difficulties. My world would be different than if I had been a, a boy or a man. And it, it is different.